My name is Bob Darrell and I am an alcoholic. You could see the lack of power still was my dilemma. Um, through the grace of a very loving God who I didn't believe in, who I found is crazy about me and has no taste, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, good sponsorship, and a commitment to this way of life. I haven't had a drink or any mind or emotion altering substances since Halloween 1978. And for that, I owe you my life. You know, it said the thing on the program said this was a spirituality meeting. Every meeting is a spirituality meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous. As a dear friend of mine says, uh, there's two sides to the program, the spiritual side and the outside. Um, <laughs> it's really to label one meeting spiritual as opposed so it makes the rest of the meetings will be selfish and decrepit, I think. Um, <laughs> I, I want to talk about something that is dear to my heart because an experience that I've had in Alcoholics Anonymous that if I didn't have it and try to maintain it, I probably would have died probably by my own hands years ago. And that's this coming to believe and connect and actualize a relationship with a power greater than myself. I, I want you to know that I was the guy who came in and out of AA for a number of years, and every time I heard someone talk about God, it was like a steel door would slam in my head. And I didn't understand that I had a lot of prejudices in this area and a lot of fears, almost a sense that if there really was a God, I was in a lot of trouble. Because... <laughs> I, I grew up with uh, these funny prejudices, and I don't know their prejudices. And I, I work with a lot of guys that have prejudices about God that they don't even know that are prejudices because you don't think it's a prejudice because well, it's just the way it is. You don't get that it's a judgment that might be a little screwy that you don't even know where you got it. But I had a bunch of those. And one of them was a view of God. Well, first of all, he existed to judge me. He could see in the dark, which was... Not good. Uh, that's not good for a guy like me. He could read my mind, I, I was told. I, and I, oh man, I, I'm always thinking stuff I'm not supposed to be thinking. <laughs> and somewhere along the line, I threw, I surrendered to, this, to an idea, a prejudice that there can't be a God. Because if there is, it, to me, it, it looked like a lose-lose situation because I was never going to be good enough. I was never going to be the guy I need to be. And so it's easier to reject the whole thing. And, and that is, I think, is part of my nature. I, I did that with people a lot of my life. I, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and did it with a lot of you for a number of years. I would just get this thing in my head that you don't, I would imagine you don't like me, or if you really knew about me, you wouldn't accept me, so I'd beat you to it, so I'd reject you first, right? And I kind of did that with God, I, because I, my, my fear was that I'm not going to measure up. On page 44, it talks about a condition that brought me to the table in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's really one of the best descriptions of, of alcoholism. It says, if when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely. Honestly want to, like, not like the other 13, 15 times. This time I really mean it. Quit entirely. What do they mean by entirely? They don't really mean entirely, do they? I mean, that's fanatical. They don't mean everything. I can quit alcohol for long periods of time, just like Dr. Bob. If you keep me medicated, or if you give me an alternative, but what I can't do is I can't quit entirely. And I, that's a painful thing to face. That I, and the second thing, it says, or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take, and that's always been true for me. I, I always, no matter what my intentions are, as far as how far I'm going to go getting drunk, 
I just, the minute I start drinking, I move the line. You know, it just keeps moving. Uh, I, cause it, that's what alcohol does to me. It just, every drink of alcohol I've ever taken has given me the single one reaction. It's made me feel like I'd like to have another one of those. I mean, every drink I've ever taken has done that. So I have little control over the amount you take. The book says if that be the case, if you're in this trap, you can't spring or you can't stay away from it. And every time you pick it up, you burn your life to the ground, even though you don't mean to. If you're in this trap, the book says you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Well, that's not good news for a guy like me who has all the prejudices I have about God. I remember sitting in an institution up in Maine. It was I just last year I got to go back there and visit some of those places. And I was sitting in this institution and listening to an AA speaker talk. And I, by this time, I have been around Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been in and out of AA meetings for five, six years probably by this time. And I've heard a lot of AA speakers, saw, been to a lot of AA meetings. But this was the first guy I ever heard in Alcoholics Anonymous that I, I started to connect with. And he was part of a, a trustees group from Thomaston State Penitentiary in Maine. And he was, uh, they, they brought him and a couple other guys from the prison, this trust group of trustees that were on good behavior with guards to this Mother Seton Hospital where I'm in the alcoholism treatment deal there. And, and they bring this guy in and he's, he's, there's a speaker, a 10 minute speaker, and then there's this guy. And I'm sitting there li- looking at this guy and listening to him. And he's the first person in Alcoholics Anonymous I ever started to connect with. And he had really long hair and a long beard and tattoos. And tattoos were not big back in those days. I mean, you had to be a, a outlaw motorcycle guy or a gangster to have tattoos. I mean, that was... And this guy was big guy, probably 300 pounds. He'd, I think he killed a cop. He was a tough outlaw motorcycle guy. The kind of guy, if you're secretly weak and pathetic and trying to pretend like you're not and you're tough, the kind of guy you want to drink with because he'll watch your back. I mean, this is the kind of guy I'd like to drink with. And he's a man's kind of man. The kind of guy nothing would bother. This guy couldn't possibly be afraid of anything. He started talking about his drinking and his emotions. And he started saying things that just I connected with. He started talking about coming to, after maybe beating pistol whipping some guy the night before, coming to in a fetal position like a terrified little kid, shaking at the memory of what he did. In the, and and, and I'm, I'm sitting there going, whoa. I mean, I understand I feel like that all the time because I'm weak and pathetic. But you, you feel like that? You? And I think, oh, my God. And he started to talk about uh, himself. And I'm, I'll tell you, I'm ready to sign up for AA. I'm connecting with this guy. And then he talks about going to AA, working the steps, and finding God. And the minute he started talking about his relationship with God, it was like a steel door slammed in my head. And I remember sitting there thinking, oh, what have they done to him? Oh, not him. Oh, no, not this guy. Oh, I know what he's, oh, he's, he, well, he's become one of them. I had a running partner that became one of them. You know, you, you drink too much wine, you do a little bit too much drugs, your brain turns to a loaf of wet bread, and you end up a sunbeam for Jesus at the airport giving out flowers. I know. I, I understand the dynamic. And little did I know that there would come a time when I would be, in, I would be so stuck and so hopeless that all my prejudices wouldn't even mean anything anymore. I'd be willing to come to the table with something I fought against and threw away for years. Uh, the book, the Bill says something funny in, in the book. He, there's a line in here. It says, "To be doomed to an alcoholic death, or." To live on a spiritual basis, he says, for us are not always easy alternatives to face. Now, I think that's a, it's a bizarre line.
thing, but it's true. Now, we're talking door number one, alcoholic death. There's, I've watched people die of alcoholism. I know guys that have died of it. it I, I can't imagine a worse way to die. I, can't, I know there's not a way to die that where you have more shame and self-loathing. By the time alcoholism finally kills you, and it's a long, tedious process for most of us, you've wished you were dead for a long time. By the time it finally kills you, you've been in hell already. The death is just stepping, just finally stepping over the threshold. You've already been there. By the time it finally kills you, you hate yourself. Everyone you've ever loved wants nothing to do with you, and they're going to be glad you're dead. As my mother, when I was a year sober, and I, my first approach to making amends to them, she broke down with tears in her eyes because she loved me to have to tell me that she used to wish I was dead. And I did that to her. How do you take a mother's love and do that? Did an angel get its wings? <laughs> and I did that. So we have alcoholic death. Worst death there is. Or to live on a spiritual basis. And Bill says, guys like me, that's not always easy alternatives to face. It's like you, you come to meetings and people want to tell you about the steps and we're going to do God and all that stuff. You start thinking, what? How bad could that alcoholic death be anyway, really? I mean, you know. <laughs> and if you, when my mother, my mother died of a terminal illness lung cancer, and it was a very brutal, brutal deal. And I uh, got to talk to a lot of doctors back then about terminal illnesses. And Do you know, if you went to a hospice where people who have been pronounced terminal and they're dying of cancer, and there's no hope for them through human means, and you were to say to them, we got a deal here that if you'll just change your lifestyle a little bit and do a few things... There's over four million of us that have not that were terminal that did don't have to die of this disease. I'm telling you, they beg you to tell them what to do, and they do it. I go in on a weekly basis for the last 20 year, 28 years. I've gone into places where people are dying of alcoholism every week, and you lay out this simple kit of spiritual tools at their feet, and most of the time they kick it away because. They, they can't make this choice. And it's, it's ludicrous, but it's true. There's something about alcoholism that it, it's almost as if, I imagine sometimes like it has a life of its own, and it wants you dead. That's why there seems to be a, a resistance in a lot of us that well up in anything that's going to take us closer to God or freer from our disease. Almost like the alcoholism does, will make you nuts not to go there. Look at how many times some of us try to write four steps and can't pick up that 5,000-pound pen or go wash. Well, wa I'll, I used to wash my car rather than write anything. Just <laughs> What is that? It's crazy. The book says after a while we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else. And isn't it it's strange? I, I've always think I just think it's strange that I and a lot of us fight this whole idea of a spiritual experience or a spiritual awakening, and yet in reality, spend my whole life seeking that. I don't know about you guys. I drank alcohol because it it vitalized my spirit. It it allowed, gave me an awakening. A guy who was locked up in himself, depressed. I can't fit. I ain't doing too good. Could walk into a bar, a party, and have five drinks and get connected. I could come out and play. I could be a part of. I could feel plugged in. It really was a spiritual experience. Putting aside all my prejudices about religion and spirituality, the truth always has been that when I, in my early days of alcoholism, no matter how sick my spirit is, five shots of tequila would vitalize it. Not at the end. Not the last couple years. But for years it did that for me. And especially in the years when the hook is set. And the obsession is put into place. 
So I, I got a deal here. I, I, I got to come to the table. I don't want to come to the table. Uh, earlier in the book, there's a, uh, there's a place where it says that it talks about before we ever come to believe in God or even that AA will work, it says we will come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of our life as we've been living it. And I, I believed that. Before I ever believed AA would work for me, before I ever really started to believe in a power greater than myself, I believed in that. And isn't it, it's, it's, I think spiritual growth, is, it's a funny thing. It doesn't come from education. And I, I really know that. I had a, a dear friend who uh, died a few years ago with a lot of years of sobriety. He was a Catholic priest who had studied and taught theology at the Vatican. And he and was a drunk doing that for years. And he said it wasn't until he came into AA that he started to really connect with God. And it really wasn't from educating himself more in spiritual things. Because he was at the top of the food chain as far as education and, and intellectual knowledge about God. It came from throwing some of that stuff out. That spiritual growth always comes from subtraction. It never comes from addition. Never. And that's really my story. And the subtraction was that I, I got to the place where I believed in the hopelessness and futility. My best thoughts and ideas had failed me. And I'm dying here, and I've tried everything else. I, they say it, there's a saying in AA that, that Alcoholics Anonymous is the last house of the block, on the block. I think within AA, sometimes God is the last house on the block also. Um, it says on page 45, it talks about something that's very interesting. It says, lack of power. That was our dilemma. Not lack of religion. Not even lack of faith. I've, I've known some men that have tremendous faith in God that have died of alcoholism, drank themselves to death. I've had the fortune or privilege to have sponsored uh, several members of clergy. Um, I've wa I watched a guy drink himself to death that prayed more in one day than most of us will in a week. Who knew more about God and Scripture and the Bible than most of us ever would. And he died with more faith than probably intellectually. And he could give you tremendous arguments about the, to prove the existence of God. But he could not connect with the power, with God's grace. And he died, he called me right before he died, he was weeping. Because he couldn't understand why a guy who has served God his whole life couldn't get what these bums in AA were getting. Right? But it's not lack of faith. It's lack of power. I, I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. And in the summertime, there are times when it'll get up over 115 degrees. And if I were to, if you were to come there and visit me during that time of the year, I could take you in my car and we would, we could drive out to Lake Mead, which is one of the largest bodies of fresh water in the Western United States. And I could show you the lake and you'd know that the lake was there and then take you about 15, 20 miles away and drop you off at the middle of the desert with a map on how to get to Lake Mead. And I'm telling you that if you don't follow the directions on that map, you will wander around that desert and die of thirst knowing that water's there. Knowing. And that seems to be the problem. Is that I have to access this power. And that's the dilemma. If I don't, I'm going to die. I... Uh, I, I I struggled. I remember when Frank died, who was a was a priest, uh, that just blew my mind. You know, because I under at the time I was sober a little while, and I understood and believed with everything in me that I was only sober through God's grace, and I knew that. I knew that. 
And yet I, what was so baffling to me is why, why would, you know, you'd think if that's true, a man of the cloth would have a leg up on the rest of us, right? And then at other times I've watched, uh, I, I had my own experience. I, I was in a, I came to in a jail cell uh, up in Maine, and I was up there on a geographic. I didn't know it was a geographic. I thought it was just crossing state lines to avoid incarceration. But I, uh, the people would say, hey, we'll educate you about this stuff. And I was up there on a geographic. And uh, I had one friend left in the world, this guy Chris Morgan, who I've tried to find and try, keep trying to find him. He's on my eight-step list, never been able to find him. And Chris was a great guy, and he helped me out, put me up on his couch, and got me a job. And I come to in this jail cell, and I don't know why I'm there, and I'm sick, and I need a drink, and I'm shaken. I want to jump out of my skin, and they take me into a room, and a detective tells me I'm there because I took a hunting knife and opened up Chris's chest the night before. And I'm sitting there in that detective's office, and I feel this, these emotions like I'm going to start screaming, and if I start, I'll never stop. And I push those feelings down and hardened up in the way that some of us can. And I, they took me back to my cell, and I fell down on that concrete floor and just came apart and started sobbing. And I did something that was out of character for me in that moment of hopelessness and weakness. I begged God to please never let me drink that stuff again. And I got drunk the day I got out. So if you've had those experiences, and then you see a guy like Frank drink himself to death who was such a good man, it's, it's, it's scary. And I didn't understand, and yet I'm sober by this time longer than I've ever been sober in my whole life since I start, started drinking at 12 years old. I, and I feel pretty good about it. And one night I was watching a movie, and it was an old movie, B, old B movie from more about World War II, and I, all of a sudden I connected the dots. I understood what had happened to me. And the movie is about this, uh, about the South Pacific. And in the South Pacific during World War II, there were so many islands that the United States did not have enough troops to station garrisons on every island. So what they did is that they would often parachute in a guy whose job was to be an observer. And he would set up a base camp, and through radio, he would, co he would keep in contact with the U.S. fleet and, and watch for Japanese troop movements and ships. And the story's about a guy who did that. And he, but on landing on the island, the radio got screwed up. And so he's setting up his camp, and he's trying to get the fleet, and he can't get this weird kind of static and stuff. And he can't get nothing. He's completely cut off. And so he goes about the business of surveying the island and building his camp. And then one day he's coming up over this sand dune, and there's the whole Japanese fleet and they're coming towards his island, and he panics, and he runs back to the camp, and he's, he's hitting the radio and screwing with it and trying to get the fleet in, because he's, now it's desperate, and he can't get nothing. And he, he remembers, he thinks, wait, wait a minute, there was a manual somewhere. And he starts digging through this duffel bag. In the bottom of the duffel bag, he pulls out this manual. And he starts reading the manual, and it starts describing the symptoms of the radio, the weird static and all the stuff that's going on. And then it gives him some tests to try uh, and some things to do. And, he, and it leads him into finding this tube that's been knocked loose and resetting it. In the, and all of a sudden, there's the fleet. There it is. And the reason he couldn't get the, the juice, or couldn't get the power from the, the message, the deal from the fleet, was not because he was a bad guy or he played with his knobs too much or none of that stuff. It was just simply that he had a broken receiver. And I started to get, that's it. That's the deal. God has always loved me. God has, is crazy about me. God has exists to give me his grace. 
But I got a broken receiver. And I can't receive it. And I think that's why people will die of alcoholism knowing, with absolute faith, knowing God's there. But they can't access the grace because they're blocked from it. And a couple little things. Uh, on page 46, it, it talks about two things that are necessary in order to begin to connect with this power. In the middle of the page, it's, it says, We found that as soon as we were able to, first, lay aside prejudice... And with a lot of the guys I sponsor, we, we, I try to talk to them. We try to even sometimes get them to write down, what are your prejudices? What are your ideas, your opinions, your judgments, your notions about God? Especially, look, let's look for the ones that at times may make him, his love and grace give you a sense of that you're not worthy of it or you can't access it. And I'll tell you what, one of mine was, and I think a lot of us have this, and it's, it's unconscious. That's the problem with most prejudices. I don't get that they're prejudices. It's just an unconscious stance that I take towards things. And my, one of mine was this idea that God would only help me and love me when I'm good. That in my very worst day, when I've just done something I can't stand myself for, that God wouldn't help be there for me because I've, I've rendered myself unworthy of His grace. When I've just gone into a restaurant and because I haven't eaten all day and I'm really hungry and I'm nuts and the waitress doesn't wait on me quickly enough and I, I knock the sugar thing off the counter and read and start yelling at her and storm out of there. And then I'm sitting in my car and I want to go out in the garden and eat worms. Because I've become the guy that I can't stand. I've become the guy I can't stand. If, if I don't have a God that I can access, even at my very worst, i got a problem. Because that's when I need His power. I, it's when I need Him the most. And so that's a deadly, deadly prejudice. And I, so many of us have that, and, and many, many more. So the, says the first thing we have to do is lay aside prejudice. These prejudgments that I have about God, these opinions. And the second thing it says, and express even a willingness to believe. It doesn't say we have to believe. It asks for an expression of a willingness. And it says if we do those two things, it says we'll commence to get results, even though it's impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. I sort of thought that I had to understand God before I could approach Him. And that's not the case at all. Matter of fact, my desire to understand and figure God out was a very self-oriented thing. The reason I want to understand God is just the same reason I want to understand the boss at a new job. Because if you understand the way he thinks, you're going to get a little leverage there. You're going to get a little more control. You're going to feed self a little. I mean, what about it's going to do me, 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 me. Like maybe if I could understand God enough, I could... I could tailor my prayers in such a way to get the the Bentley and the new house. You know what I mean? Just, but you have to make him see that this is what's necessary, and you just kind of understand him so you can lay that down. Book says, "Don't even try." A friend of mine says that if God's small enough for me to understand him, he's not big enough for me to, to help me. That's and I believe that's true. So if I can just express a willingness. And the, what the old timers in AA told me to do was stuff that didn't make any sense to me. I'm living in this halfway house because I'm a homeless guy. And they told me that I, I, I must get down physically, get down on my knees every morning and every night and turn my consciousness towards whatever's running the universe. And, and to know that I needed, I needed help from that. And I knew that. I knew that I didn't have... By this time, after seven and a half years of relapsing, I know that I don't have what it takes to stay sober. I know that. I don't know a lot, but I know that. And so I would turn 
I'd go in the bathroom at the halfway house, and I, because I don't believe in God, so I'm embarrassed to do this. So I lock the door. I push the throw rug up against the crack underneath the door, like as if I'm afraid somebody's going to peek under there to see me pray or something. Like I'm nuts, right? I'm whacked. And I get down on my knees and I say, okay, whatever's there. I'm scared and I need some help. And I don't, I don't, I need your help to stay sober. And at the end of the day, I would just simply get down in there on my knees and I'd thank whatever that was. And some funny things started happening to me. From the moment of this expression of willingness. And I, I didn't understand that the physical demonstrations are so powerful. And, you know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, we often talk about change of attitude. And I didn't know what that meant for a long time. Pilots talk about attitude. It's the angle of approach. And if you've got a bad attitude in an airplane, you're going to land in the mall. Right? You're going to land, you're going to hit the side of a mountain. So you must adjust your attitude, your angle of approach. And what the problem with me and God is not God. It's my angle of approach. And from the moment I started to take actions against my natural inclinations, what I started to do is I was changing my angle of approach. So I was starting to access this grace, this power. There's amazing stuff started happening to me from the moment I did that. Uh, I, I, was, I was living in this halfway house. I got one roommate that's shooting heroin and another one that's smoking pot. Like, and I'm, I'm on thin ice here. Out of nowhere, a guy came to me and offered me a job with room and board living in a treatment center for teenagers, being the house manager. I'm telling you, this job was divinely crafted for me. It did not give me a lot of money, because a lot of money, I would have ended up in a saloon telling everybody how smart I was. It was just enough money to start chipping away at some amends, having money to put in the basket and maybe get a pack of cigarettes. But it gave me, put me in a position to think of others. I could get to two meetings a day. When I lived there, it was perfect for me. Perfect. Then it got me out of a very dangerous... And I didn't look for that job. It just came to me. I had other things happen to me like that. Like, I, I, I used to... I would go through these really awful mood swings in early sobriety. Unexplicable stuff, because I don't understand myself to know why, why I go from one minute feeling like I'm on top of the world to the next minute into this abyss. And I, I had dozens and dozens of experiences like that where I'd go to some meeting and there'd be a stranger there talking about what's going on with me. And he's got my answer. I remember one time coming, I, just, I was so hustled at work. I, I went to a noon meeting and I'm nuts. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go back after the noon meeting and quit my job because they've been disrespecting me and taking advantage of me. And, it, and just, it just they've really been, it's been bad. And I go to a meeting and there's a stranger there talking about something that went on with him in the job. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, my God, I don't have to quit my job. i got to make amends to my boss for being an idiot. It, that would never have occurred to me naturally, never. And I started to experience the hand of something working in my life. I mean, who's, choreographer, who's the choreographer behind all that? And I started to come to believe in something I... I I suspect the only way a guy like me could really by what started to happen to me. Over, over in London, to, to this day, there's parts of London that the streets are lit by gas streetlights rather than electric. And uh, years ago, before they had the electric starters and the, before they were all gridded and automatic, there was a guy whose job it was at, at dusk was to go up and down the streets of London, and he had a key to turn the gas on and a long pole with a flame on the end to light the, light the deal. And he was called a lamplighter. And you could climb up to the top of the highest building in, in London and look out over the city, and you, no matter how hard you looked, you couldn't see where the lamplighter was. But you could always see where he'd been by the lights. And I could sit in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous at three years sober, two and a half, I don't know. I couldn't see where God was, really. But boy, could I see where he'd been. 
I mean, I could see where he'd been. And even more closely and more distinctly than seeing where he'd been in my life, man, could I, I was doing a lot of 12-step work. I, I was going into the hospitals and institutions. I could see the hand of God and some of these new people that came in six, eight months after me. I saw the deadness of the eyes. I saw, I saw the hopelessness. I met the guys that would never see their kids again. Because of the restraining orders. I met the guys that were so far in debt that they're not going to live long enough to get themselves out. I met the homeless guys and years later they're buying their first home and the guy's got his kids. And I mean, in tremendous transformations. And I came to believe, I guess, the only way that I could. I had to see it. It had to be up close and personal. I, some people have an ability... That someone they respect will tell them you need to believe in this and they just go, oh, okay. Or it says it in a book and they go, oh, okay. But I'm not that guy. I'm a skeptic. I'm an over, I'm a deep thinker. There's a lot of deep thinkers in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're a deep thinker, you should not own a gun. I mean, deep thinkers that have a hard time in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm a deep thinker. And God came to me the only way that he could and he started working in my life. There's a friend of mine, uh, Jim, Jim M. He's sober 40, probably 45 years now. Lives in Pacific Palisades. He's a dear, dear man. He told me a story once that motivated me to go to Florence to try to find the statue he was talking about. And I found it, but I couldn't see it because the, you had, there was a, almost a week waiting list to get in this one museum. But he told this story that just lit me up. And he said he was walking around this, this very famous museum in Florence and looking at this exhibit of sculptures from the, sculpture, from the sculptor Donatelli. And Donatelli does a lot of spiritual sculptures. Was hallucinating. He said he walked I was into this totally room and there was a, a life-size statue of the Mary Magdalene. I couldn't remember and he said the when he looked at it, it locker, took his breath I couldn't find the classroom. And he had to sit down. And one day I drove in the base. And the more he looked at it, he started weeping. Went by the century. Good morning. Good morning. Because it's, it's drove up different. This, this statue of this picture of Mary Magdalene is different than anything he's ever seen. Usually you see Mary Magdalene with the flowing robes and the long hair. And she's very pretty. That school was here. He yes. said this was not like that. This was a woman who was etched so I, with pain and hopelessness. I said, I better report this. A woman this. who looked like she'd been turning nickel and dime I tricks. Went back to the front back gate. I had just come in. I came back out and made a U-turn. And there was and the a corporal's out there. Yes, sir. I said, corporal, about her. And yet, junior school that, is gone. Show, and show said, a spark what? As she stood there with I said, I just went up to go to junior school. It's gone. It's not there. He said, come on, we better check it out. So he got the car with the... Red light and a sergeant with him. Oh, oh man, I knew it. I started, Jim's telling that Got story and I'm weeping. It was Because I know exactly <laughs> what that feels like because you start to approach God and realize he's working in your life. So Sometimes I just turned to him and I said, it which is like driving down the street and just start crying <laughs> because something has happened to me. Something that Boy, I know what I am, that I don't feel like I'm I wish sure. I could have been a fly on the wall at the front gate up. after that. But I know I never felt worthy. So shortly There's after that, probably a couple, couple more God weeks, I had a ground mouth seizure in the school. Those who seek him. Almost bit my tongue in half. They carried the me off to the of hospital. Approach, of changing my to see what could have caused the attitude. seizure. There's no this alcohol thing, so they, they don't, the don't say alcohol. I don't know what it could be. Mental, all that. And about six you know, days later, I had the delirium treatments, the DTs. On page 55, DTs. there's two I paragraphs saw all these that have become frightening CIA trying two to break of my me more mentally and favorite put me away paragraphs forever. of the book because it's and really just, a I guess vision I panicked and of exactly screaming. what happens to every single one of us. And they put me in a straitjacket and locked me up in the nut board for six months. To this primary purpose so that was my boom. And it's somewhere a in there... Of, of some exactly where, talk to psychiatrists exactly into how, and, bring an AA and exactly meeting. when we will find and an so access three of us power, which is God. We're marched down there by the corpsman, all drunk, it, fall it, in. And that's and really the, the purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous. It says in our book, our main purpose is and I heard to the story. help you find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. The, I think the great single most great promise of all of AA is, is stated and read in every meeting. Most people don't even hear it. It's in step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the, the meaning single most only, 
as the result of these steps. I think that's the, the, that's the deal. We're here. Something must wake up inside of me or else I don't have the power to live in this world. Sobriety is too depressing. It feels like I'm doing time. I can't do this. I can't change my life. I, I can't will myself into being a guy that's having a good time sober. I don't know how to. I can't. I've tried therapy. I've tried everything. I can't. Something must wake up within me. Or I'm, I'm toast. Page 55, it says, Actually, we were fooling ourselves for deep down, deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. In me? I used to hear guys like Chamberlain and, and some of the old timers in A talk about the God within. I used to hear people saying that they would commune with God. They would listen to the still small voice of God within them through meditation. Early sobriety, I haven't worked the steps yet. So I try to go in to connect with God. I don't find God. I find a pack of crazy people. I find legion. I find just, just nut stuff going on. I can't even be alone in, in an apartment without the TV on because when it gets quiet out here, it gets crazy in here. I, there's, I, if there's a God inside of me, boy, it's news to me. And I, I think if that's God, that, those voices sound more like Satan to me. I don't <laughs> Crazy. But, but it, it explains why I can't just go in and connect. It says because it may be obscured. This power may be obscured, which is blocked by three things. By calamity. I like calamity. I like, I like the edge. You know what I mean? There's excitement on the edge. I'm the guy. I go to an amusement park. I'm right at the roller coaster. You won't get me on the merry-go-round. I'm right going, I want calamity. I want excitement. I have always misinterpreted excitement for happiness. It's crazy. And I think serenity is like, is the feeling you get when you just about died. You know, I mean, I, th I think that's serenity, right? <laughs> if you're identifying with me, you need AA badly. I'm telling you, badly. <laughs> I like calamity. If you don't know what calamity is, imagine, you want to hear the voice of calamity, imagine that a surgeon could surgically implant a microphone into your brain on a bad day, hooked up to speakers, and we get to hear what you think for one day, we would hear calamity. <laughs> the second thing it says it's blocking me is pomp. Is that I am so defended and opinionated and judgmental. I'm so full of myself that I'm like a glass of water that there's no room for anything else. I, it's just me and my judgments and my perception and my view of life and me, 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 me. me. I'm just there. You know, God could be inside of me with a megaphone in between the pump and the calamity. I ain't get. He, there's nothing. He ain't getting through. There's too much of me between me and God. Just like the loneliness that I felt every time I got sober because there's too much of me between me and you and too much of me between me and God. And then the third thing it says is worship of other things. I, that's a hard thing for me to see because I don't know what they're talking about, really. And I was a year and a half, two years sober and I'm... I had an experience that would change my whole perception of, of what this was about for me. I, I was ending a, my first sober relationship. And in my experience, I don't think there's a more self-involved person on the planet than an alcoholic ending a relationship. I mean, oh, man. You can go up to a person like that and say, that, I just came from the doctor and I have terminal cancer and two weeks to live. And he'll go, you know what else she said, man? I mean, you know. <laughs> Oh, it's funny, but that's we get. That's the way we are. I mean, you know. Oh man, and I'm. That's what I'm doing. And I'm at this AA meeting one night, and I'm nuts. I can't. I can't hear anything in the meeting. It's like music in a doctor's office. Because I'm in my head thinking, if when I see her, I'll say this, and then she'll say that, and then I'll say this, and then she'll say that, and then I'll hit her with this, and she'll be properly ashamed of herself and beg me back. You know, so I'm crazy, right? And if you're, 
Uh, plus, she's a member of AA and she's not in this meeting, which means that some hideous force has implanted a spring in the back of my neck connected to the meeting room door. Every time the door opens, I go, oh, oh not her. Okay. All right, so, so God could be trying to talk to me through the people in AA, and I get it. I mean, I'm just blocked, right? The meeting's over, and I end up going to coffee with some people, and end up me and this guy from Glendale, who was visiting, who was sober about 28 years, and I started to tell him, now a captured audience, since he rode there in my car, I got it. So I'm telling him about this relationship for 20 or 30 minutes till his eyes have glazed over. <laughs> And he sits there very kindly and he's listening to me and nodding and, you know, and just like, you know, like A's do. And when I'm done, man, he said some things that just rocked me. He said, he, first of all, he says to me, he says, he says, you ever thought about the first commandment? And I said, ah, no, I'm not into that. I'm just into AA. He said, yeah, he says, I know. He says, man, you and I are a lot alike. He says, guys like us can't get past the thou shalt not. <laughs> He said, the first commandment is that I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have false gods before me. He said, he said, I think the Ten Commandments were originally written as statements of spiritual cause and effect. That somehow as they got translated through the different languages, the Greek and the Aramaic and the Greek, Latin, etc., etc., somehow they got an authoritarian spin put on them. He said, I don't think they were that way originally. He said, it is my experience that God loves you no matter what you do. He loves you and loves you. That you can put anything you want between you and God and he still loves you. The problem is you've just put something between you and God. And he said when you worship something, it doesn't mean to bow down to. It means to obsessively turn your consciousness towards. He said you want to know what you worship in your life? Make a pie graph of everything you've been thinking of, and the thing that dominates the pie is obviously the thing you've been obsessively turning your consciousness towards. When he said that, I could picture this pie graph with a little sliver for work, and a little sliver for A, and the rest of it was her. And I knew instantly why I felt such desolation and why I was stuck in my head and I was disconnected from you and disconnected from God. Because I'm the guy who did that. And I did it because of a lack of power. And I look, I think that a relationship will give me the power to validate myself and give me some emotional security, a sense of connect, connectedness. I'll be a part of this. And I'm seeking and I'm at the helm of my ship and I keep putting these things in between me and God. And I wish I could tell you from, from that moment on, I haven't done that, but I'm too, man. And I keep doing it. Matter of fact, if there's anybody here that never does that, would you help me, please? Because <laughs> I keep doing it. And it, sometimes I put just being right about something. You know what I mean? That thing you, you just, you don't want to let go because not until they see. <laughs> huh? Or money. I put money in that spot a lot of times. And why, is, why, why would a guy like me be worried about money? Because money can give you an illusion of power and control and validation and security. But it's an illusion. You know why it's an illusion? Because I, I know I finally, God spoke to me and gave me the amount of money necessary that you need. You know what it is? Just enough so you don't have to trust him anymore. You know what that dollar amount is? Five dollars more than you will ever have. Because no matter how much you have, it'll not be enough. It's always more and more and more. Because money is not power. It's an illusion of power. Real power. The book says there is one, only one, who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now or at least before you drink again. And so I'm looking for, that's why I worship these. That's why I make these things so important to me. Because I, I'm, I'm, I don't have any power and I think I'm going to get power from this stuff. The book goes on to say a couple things. It says, it says, we finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our makeup just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly 
but he was there. The only other place in AA that I know of that uses those two words together is in the fourth step. Fearless in searching moral inventory. And oddly enough, it is not until the fifth step promises on page 75 that it says, you're, it doesn't say it after step three. It's not until you've cleaned away some of the stuff, some of the pomp, some of the, you know, from all your judgments on your resentment list, some of the calamity that you'll see very clearly on your, uh, on, on your fear list that you create were this based on self-reliance and some of the things you worship that will appear both on all three lists and also sex, how often we make that a big deal in our lives, our relationships. It is not until after step five that some of us seem to really start to connect. It says at that point, we'll feel the nearness of our creator. Why? God's always been there. But now what's happened is I've moved out just enough of me that I can start to feel the presence of God. Because I'm, get, I'm jettisoning the things that are blocking me through this process of four through seven. And they're actual, sometimes it's not actualized until step nine, until I actually face the people and make amends. And I'm starting to connect. And what, what happens, the funny thing in the steps is the steps are not designed to make amends to God. So I'm closer to God. The steps are designed to remove the stuff between me and you. And what happens is when that happens, God shows up. There is no view. See, I'm one of those kind of guys that wanted, uh, I thought maybe me and God will be good and I can still think you're all idiots. Right? And it never works that way. You want to measure your distance from God, measure your distance from the people around you. Right? Because they're God's kids. And when I separate from me from you, I'm separating me from the God within you. And I'm really separating myself from God when I separate myself from you. Um. So we had to search fearlessly. Well, he was there, but he was as much a fact as we were. If we found the great reality deep down within us. What a tremendous term for God. Capital letters, the great reality. In, in chapter 5, they read it every meeting, and they, t they talk about the place you'll find God. I didn't realize it was a place. It says, there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him in a place most of us never visit. Now. Right? And that's the great reality. God is present. He is the presence. And I miss it, and I'm disconnected from it because I'm up here thinking about it. Trying to figure it. What, is it. what does that mean? Analyze it. Because I want control. The great reality deep down within us in the book says, finally it says in the last analysis, after I've looked everywhere else, in the last analysis that is only there that he may be found, it was so with us. That is definitely my experience. You know, it was, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous in the last analysis. After I'd tried religion and treatment and medications and therapists and some of the great... I, I really identified with a guy last night. I was in therapy with Albert Ellis. Because my dad was so politically connected. He used to send me up to New York to the Institute for Rational Emotive Therapy. I was in therapy with some a contemporary of Fritz Perls. I tried everything on the radar to fix me. I'm telling you, everything. The end results, I'm standing on a bridge trying to take my own life because I am stuck in a trap I can't spring. I can't jumpstart the party that alcohol is no longer a spiritual experience and I can't live without it because there's a desolation about my and a depression about my abstinence and I'm stuck. And so after everything else, I try AA. And then in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, I did every, my first four years of sobriety was crazy. I didn't stay sober, but I suffered periodically from untreated alcoholism. And I'm going to 15 and 20 meetings a week. I'm a GSR, I'm a DCM, I'm intergroup, I'm doing hospital and institutions, I'm going on 12-step calls, I'm trying to outrun my alcoholism. But as, as Chamberlain said one time, he said, the alcoholic always gets to a point where you can no longer put anything between you and you. And then the shyness, you can't outrun it anymore. And there you are. And that ain't no good. Because it's never been good, 
Really? And there it is. And a little over four years of sobriety, I started following the process in this book. And I started to finally connect with something as I cleared away the things that that kept me in the driver's seat. As I started to dismantle my will in this fourth step, which is really my my judgments and all the other crap. I started to connect with this power greater than myself. And uh, my life has never been the same since. I'm no longer the guy that has to outrun his alcoholism. And yet I still go to a lot of meetings. I probably go to seven a week, I suppose. Sometimes more, sometimes sometimes maybe six, sometimes eight, I don't know. I have several commitments in AA, and I do that because I like the vitalization of helping others and doing service. I, I've connected those dots that that's the good dope here. I was right before I went back through the steps. <clears throat> I'll tell you this story, and I'm, I'll, I'll end. Um, I was working for a man who was trying to redeem me an employer, as an employee. And you got to understand, by the time I worked the steps again, I'd gone through nine jobs in a little over four years. You can, that, that's a whole story. That'll show you where I'm at. And it's never my fault. I can't help it. I just keep ending up working for idiots. You know, I just, <laughs> you know, you, you can see through that, right? You know the truth, right? So this guy's trying to redeem me. And he gives me a set of motivational tapes, not, not AA. It's a, a set of tapes by a guy named Earl Nightingale called Lead the Field. And it's supposed to kind of, he's trying to help me become a better, less self-centered employee and Earl tells a story in there, and when I heard this story, man, I, I, I got it. And the story, supposedly, Earl says, is true. And I've done a little research, and I think it is true to some degree. I've heard different versions of it. But the details are not important, is, is what the experience of hearing it. And St- Earl told the story about a guy in South Africa who had inherited a ranch um, and it was a nice ranch, and the kind of ranch that would have put his family in good stead for generations. They could have made a nice living for themselves. But the problem was is that this guy inherited this ranch at a time when the diamond boom was beginning in South Africa, when there were people who were becoming Bill Gates' mega Rockefeller rich overnight. And the more he heard the stories of their striking it rich, the more dissatisfied he became with what he had. And after a while, he was so obsessed with this, he sold his ranch and he took the money and invested it into equipment and he went out into the bush obsessed with finding diamonds. And he never did. And one account says that he died out there broke, bitter, and alone. Another account says he threw himself into the ocean and committed suicide. But we know for one thing, he didn't come to a good end. And it came to pass that this ranch he'd sold to these developers, one day they're they're moving around some rocks and stuff, and they found these unusual-looking big rocks, and they didn't know what they were. And they took them to a guy, and they found out they were uncut diamonds, and they're raw. And they discovered that this ranch was the largest diamond deposit ever recorded in South Africa. These, these guys became like two of the richest men in the world, like overnight. And now, now they have to have, hire all these people and develop these mines. And they got to cut the diamonds and market them and ship them for distribution all over the world. And they're talking one day, and the one guy says, the other guy says, well, we need to name our company now. And the other guy says, yeah. He says, hey, let's name it after that poor uh, SOB we bought this place from. He says, the guy says, yeah, what was his name? He says, it was De Beers, wasn't it? And I'm listening to this story, and I'm thinking, I'm that idiot. I'm looking. I come into Alcoholics Anonymous. I look everywhere else for power and validation and security. And jobs, went through nine of them. And relationships, went through a few of those. And being a GSR and a DCM and an area officer and doing H&I work and trying to get a lot of sponsees, I'm looking for security, validation, and power everywhere else. And in the last analysis, after I'm at the point where I can't outrun my self-obsessed depressions anymore and the loneliness, 
I started to take this journey to uncover, as Chuck would say, discover and discard the things that have been blocking me from God and ultimately from you because it's a package. I think what Einstein said is true, that the great illusion of mankind is that there's more than one of us here. That I, if I want to get closer to God, I must clear away the stuff between me and you that really is the aspects of me playing God with you. The judgments, the separation, so that I can claim my place. And this is something I have struggled with because I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I can completely dismantle the judgment machine that is self and, and surrender it ultimately. And within no time at all, it grows back like a bad tumor. And I'll be the guy who's in charge again. And you know how you know when you're in charge? You just start seeing the people that need straightened out around you. <laughs> and I look out over you today, and you all look like you're doing pretty good. Now, if I look at you too closely, I'll start noticing a couple you need straightened out. But I want to thank you for allowing me to be here and, and, and thank you for my life in Alcoholics Anonymous. Thanks. <clears throat>